You've heard me teach and preach the importance of attitude, and you've heard me say that perception determines attitude, and attitude determines approach, and then approach determines success or failure. In other words, how we see a thing will determine our attitude towards things. Some of us have traveled more than others, and so we have a different world view, if you would. We can see things a little differently than the person who perhaps hasn't traveled. In other words, we have a broader set of lenses. When people are looking just through the regular peepers, we then can see through binoculars. And so perception determines attitude, and then attitude determines our approach. So based on the kind of attitude we have, that will determine how we approach a thing. For instance, if you're going in for a job interview, and you have an attitude that you're not going to get hired anyway, well, you may come in sagging and bagging and leaning and gleaming and hair uncombed and face unwashed and 12, 30 o'clock shadow and because of the attitude. So attitude determines how we approach a thing. And then our approach determines whether or not we will be successful or whether we will fail at a thing. Now, stick with me for a minute. We are witnessing at this hour the most exciting presidential race in the history of our nation. So many records have been broken. So many enigmatic things have happened. And we are a part of history. Our children will read about what has taken place over these last 21 months and these next three days. It will be recorded in textbooks at some point in time, regardless of who wins. This has been an exciting time. This election will establish mindsets and readjust other mindsets. And I believe that God is always speaking to his people. He speaks through his word. He speaks through the prophetic. He speaks through circumstances and situations. He speaks through music. And he speaks through the context and culture of time. We may have a black man as president for the first time in the history of this nation. We may have a woman for vice president in the first time in the history of this nation. And that says to us, the church, how far the world has come. Now, pardon my non-political correctness, I don't use the term African American because I believe in the Bible. And if you look in Genesis, Adam in the creation story was created and placed in the garden with Eve in Africa. 
It's real clear. It says because the Euphrates River, the Tigris, the Gihon, and the Pison all intersected there. In today's time, there's one place where that intersection is, and that's in Africa. So I don't say African Americans because with that terminology, all of us are African Americans because we all come from Adam and Eve. So I just want to make a distinction this morning. Some of you, that's messed up your theology, but it's in the book. It's in the book. I prefer to use the term black man. Now, we have to ask ourselves as believers, what does this mean? What do these events mean? We can't sit back and be complacent and just watch the news and, and turn our heads and, 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 and become uh, 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 just, just dormant to what's taking place. Because God is speaking to the church. And here's what I think this means. I want to tell you what I think it means for the people. And I want to tell you what I think it means for the church. For people of color and for people of lower socioeconomic status, it means no more excuses. It means no longer can you say, I can't do this or I can't achieve this because of the man. It means no longer can you say, I'm in the position I'm in because the man brought my ancestors over. No more excuses. It means that there is a raising of the bar. Preachers, it means that the messages you preach have to have a higher standard, have to be at a higher caliber. Praise team, it means that the songs that you minister have to have a deeper and broader anointing. Ushers, it means that when you usher, the standard of ushering has to be lifted. It means when we parent, no more excuses. I'm a single mom. That's why little Johnny is running around town robbing all the 7-Elevens and liquor stores. No more excuses. If you stand back and you look at this thing, God is speaking to his people. It's not a time for blacks to, to feel superior. Only to the, the degree where we feel superior enough to make no more excuses. Look at the person next to you and say, no more excuses. You can't use an excuse when you're late for something. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Pastor must be talking about you, because you started squirming. <laughs> Beloved, it's the raising of the bar. I'm going to get to scripture here. Give me a moment. I told you to put on your mask. It's like a, an airplane taking off. Let me, let me just stay on the runway for another minute. We have been, and I say we, the collective we, we have been in a mode of celebration for almost 
300 years. Let me say that again. Y'all excuse me for a second. Black folk have been in a mindset of celebration for too long. A mindset of celebration, a mindset of recreation, and ignoring things like education. Is there a wonder why if you want to find a liquor store, you go to the black neighborhood? Every corner. Is there a wonder why if you want to find a high overpriced convenience store, if you go to the black neighborhood? That's because we've been celebrating and not educating. Is there a wonder when you go to the black neighborhood you find junkyards? Very few schoolyards? But you can always find the graveyard? Look at one more person this morning and say no more excuses. Whether y'all know it or not, that scripture says, old man, you are without excuse. No more excuses. It would be a tragedy to sit back, regardless of who wins, and slide back into celebration mode. It is time to press forward. Now let's get to the church. For I move there, women. Everybody look at a woman. Even if you're a woman, look at a woman. Say, women, no more excuses. <laughs> this nonsense about it, it's a glass ceiling. Uh-uh. Hey, come on. You know, the benefit of it being a glass ceiling is that you can break it. That you can see through it. No more excuses. No more. Acts 9 and 31. This is an interesting passage. And one of the things that we teach here is that balance is a key to life. And so many of us have gone down the path where we've gotten something on the way, on the journey, and held on to it and not picked up anything else. And so we have become out of balance. I know in the denomination, denominational background I came from, holiness, I was taught that if you didn't speak in tongue, you weren't saved, that you'd have to come to the church and you'd have to stay there all night long and, and tarry for the Lord to visit you. And that if you didn't speak in tongue, then the Lord really didn't love you like he loved everybody else. And that if you didn't fast for 30 days or whenever the saints was fasting, well, they say they was fasting. 